Well, I have the top of the hour, so let's begin. Welcome, everyone. Welcome to the Future Trends Forum. I'm delighted to see you all here today. We have a fantastic guest and an incredibly powerful subject, and I'm really looking forward to our conversation. We've been exploring what climate change might mean for the future of higher education for a year now. Uh, my new book is on the subject, which I'll talk about in the session coming up. But I wanted to bring this week's guest here because of a particular angle, a particular approach. Many people, when they think about climate change, tend to think in terms of optimistic strategies, practical strategies, things that one can do. But our guest comes from a, a project, a movement called the Dark Mountain, which argues that perhaps these optimistic approaches are not really going to help. Perhaps instead, we are in the middle of a spectacular crisis and we'll have to get used to a form of decline that we might not be able to stop or mitigate climate change, and that we will have to deal with a world where progress has stopped. At one point in his new book, which you can find a link to in the bottom left of the screen, our author says this, quote, the work that lies ahead looks less like sustaining modern lifestyles at all costs, and more like salvaging what we can from these ways of living, while learning from many other ways that humans have made life work in the long history of our species. Dougal Hine is an educator, uh, a, a creator, a writer. He's done a great many things, including being a journalist for the BBC. And I'm absolutely delighted to welcome him here. Uh, let me just bring him up on stage and he can join us. Hello, Dougal. Hello. You've Hi, made everyone. it. Greetings. Where have we found you today? Well, I am sitting in a library in an old shoe shop that is on its way to becoming a school called home. And uh, our family live upstairs from here and down here where I'm talking to you from, the whole of the ground floor is our workshop space and where we bring people together. Excellent. And this is in central Sweden? It is. It's about uh, 50 minutes by bus from Uppsala. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So not that far from Stockholm. We're just sort of between the center and the edges, really, in Swedish. Okay. Very good. And it must be something like 10 o'clock at night there. Uh, so. Not quite. Eight, eight o'clock. It's not too painful. Well, I'm, I'm very glad. I'm very glad you could make it. Um, we have a tradition on the forum where we ask people to introduce themselves, not by talking about their past, but about what they're going to be working on in the future. And I'm, I'm curious. I, I've already mentioned, I think, two major things uh, for you, uh, the school called home and also this new book. Are those the main focus for the rest of 2023 for you? Or do you have something else you're working on too? Well, one way and another, those things are going to be keeping me busy. Um, okay. I, mean, I guess to start with the school, we're sort of midway through a half year process where we are taking our membership community that came out of five cohorts that came through an online series called Homeward Bound that I taught during the years of the pandemic. We're working with them now to move from a state where Anna and I are actively leading and hosting that to becoming a self-facilitating community ongoing. We have about mm. 100 members around the world who are part of that. We are also working with uh, an organization called Black Elephant, which mm. described itself as a, a social network based around vulnerability, based on face-to-face -face and online encounters. And that image of the black elephant, I thought actually for this context, for this futures world, uh, it's worth telling a little story about because it comes out of some work I was involved in in London back in 2009. Mm. A little gang that was known as the Institute for Collapsonomics. Mm. And of all the things that we did together, the thing that had most traction and has kind of spread around the world so that people don't really know where it originated, was coming up with this idea of the black elephant, which is a cross between the black swan and the elephant in the room. Mm. So mm. it's the thing that when it happens, everyone will say it was a black swan. It was an incredibly right. unpredictable event. Actually, it was the elephant in the room. <laughs> so we're working with um, Felix Marcard and the gang who run Black Elephant, and they're bringing together an event called Meta Plus Physics in Patmos in Greece, on the island of the apocalypse. 
in June. And yeah, the idea with Meta Plus Physics is bringing together the experts in what we know and the experts in what we don't know. And so Anna and I are going to be curating the sort of half year process by which people who are coming to that gathering in June are meeting in small groups regularly over the months beforehand so that we're building a context of relationship before we arrive and get face to face. Very good idea. That project is launching next week at Sciences Po in Paris. Um, and meanwhile, yes, you mentioned already, um, I'm about to take this book out into the world. Um, so I'll be heading off in just over a week's time, traveling around Europe and the UK, mm. taking the book into conversation with people who uh, have helped shape the thinking that led me to it, people I'm really curious to, to meet and some of those conversations will be taking place on stage in front of audiences and some of them mm -hmm. more quietly or with uh, workshops with particular groups and communities. But so that's that's what's lying ahead for me in the in the next. What what is it? 11 months we have left of 2023. You, you could say this is a road tour on the way to the apocalypse. Um, <laughs> you could and then you'd have to um, be reminded by the theologians and the linguists that the word apocalypse means a revealing, an uncovering, yes. a bringing into view of hidden things. And so in that sense, I'm yes. happy to buy that what we're talking about is, is apocalyptic. Uh, Eletheia, I think in Greek, or Eletheia, uh, to uncover the truth. <clears throat> um, we have, uh, or more prosaically, Tom mentions the road uh, in chat. Um, Dougal, I, I know you, in a recent interview, you said that you, you didn't want to be distracted by chat, um, but uh, I'll, I can handle that and, and exfiltrate content and ideas for you out loud so you won't have to uh, uh, go through that text. Um, friends, I have a whole bunch of questions to put to our author, but what I'd like to do is put a couple of big ones to him right now so that he can cut loose and really unfold his thinking. And then I'd love to hear questions from all of you. So again, if you're new to the forum, remember on the very bottom of the screen, the raised hand button and the question mark, not to mention the chat, which I don't have to tell you because it's already ripping along. Um, one question I have to do, thinking about your whole entire way of approaching higher education, what is what becomes of the research mission of universities? I mean, to a large extent, they've contributed to the modern problem by researching petroleum engineering, all kinds of projects, by pushing consumerism, by advancing new liberal economics. How should, how should the research mission change? What should faculty and support staff be looking at in order to better apprehend the next generation or two? Well, Brian, I don't know. And when I realized that the session tonight was being framed with this question of what should colleges and universities do about climate change. My first reaction was, you've got the wrong guy. Because no, no. it, it's, it's not my role to, um, to answer questions like that, really. But I have spent a lot of the last 15 years talking with people in many different contexts about climate change. And sometimes that takes me into universities yes. and I've got a deep appreciation for a lot of the work that goes on within higher education, not least within the research side of things. But part of where I come in, I think, is to shake some of the frames in which we even ask these questions. So I'd actually want to start by saying Unless you're a climate scientist, climate change might not be the most helpful frame in which to talk about mm. the thing that we're usually talking about cool. in these larger conversations in which climate change plays such a role. You know, I often talk about the trouble that the world is in. And climate change is one of the forms in which that trouble shows up. And it's often the form which shows up most alarmingly to those of us who are most sheltered from a lot of the other 
ways in which the world is in trouble. Now, I, I say one of the reasons why I've spent so much of my life talking to people about climate change is because for the winners of modernity, for those mm. of us who are most mm. sheltered from its shadow side, climate change is often the point at which we get shaken and kind of woken up and become aware of our vulnerability. There's a passage from a book that was edited by a couple of anthropologists, Mario Blazer and Marisol de la Cadena, mm -hmm. a book called A World of Many Worlds. And they say, you know, all this whole big conversation and buzz around the Anthropocene that's been going on in university departments, and cultural institutions, museums, etc., mostly emanating from big cities in Europe mm -hmm. or on the coasts of the United States over the last 10, 15 years, you know, from elsewhere, that conversation can sound a lot like the world of the powerful becoming conscious that its world too could end after five centuries or so of going around the world, ending other people's worlds and calling it progress, and development <laughs> and salvation and the rest of it. So, oh, a lot of the work that I have done has been in dialogue with folks like Vanessa Andriotti at the University of British Columbia, who wrote uh, a wonderful book called Hospicing Modernity. And again, you know, in the climate change conversations, we very often, because climate change is so big and so scary, and we're right to be disturbed by it. If you've spent any time talking to climate scientists, especially in the kind of conversations they can have when they come to the pub with you, rather than the kind of things that they can publish in scientific papers, you know oh, how deep a trouble we're in just from that front. And that is not the only front on which we're in trouble. But often where we get to in those conversations is to be talking about either we're trying to save and sustain the world as we know it, you know, modernity in Vanessa's terms, or modernity slash coloniality as Walter Mignolo, the Argentinian decolonial theorist would suggest that we call it. So either we're trying to sustain that, or we're looking at a collapse, which is somehow a singular event in the whole of human history. The whole of human history up to now, according to this story of progress that is still told in plenty of TED Talks, has been this kind of upward sweeping curve leading to now. And either we come up with the set of hacks and fixes and solutions that allow us to continue that trajectory, or the whole game is over and we failed as a species. And I don't think that's a particularly helpful frame within which to be, to be thinking about this. So to bring in one other line of thought coming from someone working in another field of research whose work I've found helpful. And maybe in a sense, what I'm doing is answering your question by showing you the way that I, as somebody who operates mostly outside of the academy, but in dialogue with people in different corners of the academy, in the arts, in activism, in many different communities, the way that I am nourished by things that are going on today in different corners of higher education and academic research. So the last example that came to mind was philosopher called Federico Campagna, who wrote a rather extraordinary book called Prophetic Culture. Mm. And in this book, he's talking about what it's like when it comes to your awareness that you're living at the end of a world. And he says, you know, sometimes this happens. Sometimes you begin to realize, it begins to dawn on you that you were born into the end of a world. And he says, if you want to be able to tell whether that's your situation, have a look at what's happening with the future in the way that it functions in your culture, in your society. Uh, the symptom of living at the end of a world is that the future no longer works because that future belongs to a story and that story has an arc and you find yourself at the end of that arc. So there isn't much story left. There isn't much future left within the ways of looking at the world that belong to that world that is ending. And so what Federico is saying is, you know, that is not a unique, if you, if you arrive at the same conclusion that I did quite a long time ago, that that is our predicament, that that's where we find ourselves. That's not 
a unique thing. That's not something that's never happened before. World's end. That's part of how it all goes on. And then he says, so what's worth doing if your reading of the signs of the times is that you're living at the end of the world you were born into? And the answer he offers, or one of the answers, is stop worrying about trying to make sense according to the logic of the world that is ending. And start trying to create good ruins. Start looking at your work through the lens of what are we leaving behind for those who are coming after, who are going to have to make sense of what the hell this was, who are going to have to build new stories, new worlds out of the ruins left behind by ours. Now, I'm not saying that's the only kind of work that is called for. There is a lot of damage limitation work that is also called for because if it is the case that that modernity is ending and as Vanessa says, you know, the challenge is not to save it, nor to try to bring it down, but to hospice it, to give it a good ending and allow it to pass on the gifts that become available at the end of its time, then, you know, we there's, there's damage limitation to do to make sure that modernity doesn't bring too much down with it. You know, clearly it's bringing a lot down with it. We have uh, contributed to the sixth mass extinction in the long history of this living world. We weren't around for the first five, so we shouldn't feel too proud of our achievement of being so central this time around. The world has managed these events before without us. And I think what's at stake is how much and in what form comes through this bottleneck that we've brought about, including in what forms humanity comes through this, this bottleneck. And so that's when I talk about the work in the ruins, those are some of the places you could start from in terms of thinking about what that work looks like. That's a fantastic answer. Um, thank you. There, there, there is so much I, I, I want to ask you to clarify about that, but everything from doing mitigation work to leaving good ruins, um, can, uh, let me press you quickly on one point because I want to make sure I understand it fully. You said uh, there's the idea that you get from Campania, but also from Mahalo about, about uh, trying to no longer think through the inherited stories that we have, but to, am I right to say, to make space for the emergence of new ones? Would that be right? That's part of it. So part of it is making space for emergence, absolutely, rather than kind of planning, you know, sometimes I get invited to these workshops where people are bringing a group of wonderful folks together for a weekend to try and come up with a new story. And I have to gently, quietly try and say, that is not how living stories come about. Mm. You know, they emerge, mm. as you say. Mm. So it's partly mm. about emergence. It's partly about listening because a lot of other stories we've been told are over or might as well be over because they belong to the past, but are actually still there among the ruins that are already here. You know, there are plenty of ruins that have been made in the name of progress, and there are plenty of people and stories inhabiting those ruins even now who we need to be listening to. And then there is also, I often talk about humbling. There's a move, and this is actually, you know, this is again, one of the dangers of the power of what science has to tell us about climate change is that it mm -hmm. can land in one of two ways. When we get that awakening of awareness of precarity that our world too could end, on the one hand, that can be a humbling. Suddenly we recognize our own vulnerability and we become able to hear the voices of those who have been wounded by people who looked like us, by people who have been part of the story that we are beneficiaries of. But the danger is it goes the other way. And that sense of vulnerability becomes the legitimation the excuse for one last grand push ah. in a desperate mode of the project of modernity to make the world manageable and knowable and controllable from above. And so we get these saving the world projects emanating from, you know, often from the same places from which a century or two earlier, literal colonialism was going on. And now people are gathering in the same places, making plans of how to use the land of India and Africa and so on as a carbon sink in order to achieve net zero. So we have to, to 
differentiate between those two utterly different things that can be going on in the name of taking climate change seriously, one of which is allowing modernity to be called into question, the other of which is doubling down in this kind of desperate last ditch attempt to somehow save the world as we've known it. Um, so yeah, that's, you know, emergence is definitely one of the, the characteristics of where I think, you know, regrowing a living culture to use the language that we often use around this school, um, where that begins and what that looks like. Well, thank you. That's a, that's a very, very powerful answer to my question. Uh, and that I have, I, I have more questions to come, but I, I want to make sure that the audience gets to ask their questions. The, the forum community, for all of you, uh, now is your chance. And even before I could ask him, uh, we have questions from uh, uh, several people, including Tom Hames, and he has a, a story question. And, and I think you, self-deprecation aside, I think you're a perfect place to answer this question, um, which is, um, oops, excuse me, let me press the correct button. Um, how does the narrative of education have to change in order to adapt to this new reality? What's, what would be a good news story? This is my question. What would be a good news story for us to make and tell? All right. Well, here's one idea, which is that we notice that our, our definition of education has blinded us to a lot of the education that is always already going on in the world. There's a Canadian scholar, I think his name is uh, Derek Rasmussen, either, either Derek or David, apologies mm -hmm. to him, um, who talks about the restaurant theory of education. He says, modernity has had this idea of how education happens that is a bit like if you had an idea of food where you said in order for there to be food, there needs to be a restaurant. And the restaurant in this analogy is the school. And so we go around the world and when we can't find schools, we say there is no education happening here. And then we say we must build schools quickly and teach mm -hmm. them how schools work. And you know, in terms of the humbling that I'm talking about, in terms of navigating a situation in which we are just going to have to let go lots of things we've taken for granted lately around here, on the downward curve, becoming aware, having our eyes opened to how much learning and how many deeply raw cultural institutional practices of learning exist in the world that have been invisible to the lenses through which we have been going out into the world from countries like ours over the last couple of hundred years. And if you want one person whose research could be really helpful in finding a, a route into that, I'm thinking of Munir Fasher, who was a Palestinian mathematician. He was a Harvard professor also an educational activist in Palestine, in the West Bank. And he says the greatest turning point in his career was after he had arrived at Harvard as a mathematician, it dawning on him that his illiterate mother, who was a dressmaker in a village in Palestine, was practicing a complex mathematics in the way that she measured and cut cloth that he could not fully himself understand, but that he could recognize was a whole practice of applied mathematics that was off the radar, illegible to the way in which he had been taught to value his discipline. And so he went back and worked in Palestine, working with educational practices that bring into view the forms of knowledge and learning that just go missing when we look at the world through the lenses, most of us who have been successful within the academic institutions of modernity have been taught to, to look at the world. So those might be some sources for some helpful stories that we could experiment with, come into dialogue with. Well, thank you for that answer. And, and Tom, as always, thank you for a, a, a really great question. Uh, again, if you're new to the forum, that's an example of a text question. And now I'm going to give you another example uh, of a text question. Uh, and this is from Charles Findlay at Northeastern University, who takes us on a different angle, but I don't think it's a tangent. Uh, he asks, what are your thoughts on ego disassociation, psychedelics, and environmental activism? Wow. Well, that's a bundle of things to put together, isn't it? It um, is. It is. I mean, so 
We have a whole lot going on right now around psychedelics, which is kind of reflected in the fact that a question like this would come up in a forum mm -hmm. like, mm -hmm. where you know, plant medicines have been part of many, many human cultures, including in European contexts for large stretches of human history. And then within modernity, uh, essentially what happened was that those plants were kind of bred down to things that fitted industrial society that were less mind altering and more addictive. So if you look at the difference between the way that tobacco functions in a ritual context in uh, Turtle Island and the way that tobacco functions in a modern industrial society, you get a glimpse of quite how extreme that transformation is. And now, you know, one of the symptoms of being at the end of modernity is a loss of confidence in the single central narratives. We've had 50 years of you know, postmodernism, which is both a diagnosis and a symptom of that. And so things come in from the edges, but they come in to a culture and a society that has been taught to consume. Mm -hmm. If we go back to Ivan Illich 50 years ago, he would have been telling us schools teach us to be consumers. They teach us to be helpless and dependent on commodities. And so you know, the helpful things that are being held in other cultures in relation to plant medicine are arriving in a culture of hungry consumers, culture of hungry ghosts, we might say, hmm. and hmm. arriving also in a culture in which almost the only way that things are ever brought to us are through their commodification and marketing. And I think that there's a lot of danger in the way that psychedelics are suddenly going from you know, being completely off the radar or illegal to rapidly turning into the new growth industry. Nonetheless, it, I, I would be telling you a lie if I said that I hadn't met many people who have played central roles in the environmental movements, including the climate movements that emerged in 2018, 19, that I write about quite a bit in the book. Mm -hmm. who have had you know, powerful and important experiences facilitated by encounters with psychedelics. So it's, it's there in the mix. But I'm, I'm pretty wary of the way that we tend to turn to it because we're so well trained in becoming consumers. Mm -hmm. I would be more keen to hold up something like the work that Martin Shaw the mythographer, mythologist, storyteller, and founder of the School of Myth and Story, the West Country School of Myth and Story in the, the West of England. The work that he's done over many years working with the wilderness rites of passage tradition, mm -hmm. which is also something that appears in very many different cultures. You find it in the anthropological and historical record. You find it as a living practice in many cultures today. And Martin and I have talked about this problem of how well-trained we all are at being consumers. And he says, well, the great thing about taking people out to sit for four days and nights fasting on a mountainside is that by the fourth day, your body is literally starting to eat itself because you haven't had anything other than water for four days. And so there is this sense that the price of entry is to be consumed. And so I'm always looking for like where are the things that rupture our habits of consumption powerfully enough that we break through to something real rather than getting trapped back into selling each other things? Mm. I guess, I guess a, a, an answer to that, that combination of things that you brought into the room there. Well, Charles, thank you. Uh, that's, a, that's a very, very bold question. And thank you, Dougal, for, for wrestling with it. Uh, Friends, you can see that uh, we're very friendly here, so please, please bring up your, your questions and comments. Uh, we also have a question from Donald Clark, who's coming to us from, uh, I'm not sure where he is today. He's often on the road, so I'm guessing maybe Scotland, but, he, but he'll, he'll correct me if I'm wrong. And he wants to push back like so. He says, it seems like this is the same sort of Marxist historicism that Karl Popper criticizes, that certainty about the future that becomes a closed story and dogma. Well, it's been a while since anyone called me a Marxist, um, but Enjoy. given given that I've learned a lot from John Berger and Gustavo Esteva, both of whom owed a lot to Marxist traditions, I'm not going to completely shake that uh, off. I So what am I trying to say I'm certain about? Not very much. You know, in the book, I talk about uh, the importance of not pretending we know how the story ends. 
the importance of uh, surrendering to the mystery of all of this rather than surrendering to a kind of dark certainty that the end of the world is nigh. But I think we're already a good way into a process which can reasonably be read as an unraveling, an unraveling which is coming to us and often the alarm is sounded most loudly on the ecological front. And again, I say to you, just go to the pub with some climate scientists and ask them their judgment. You know, when I say that climate scientists will come, will tell you things in the pub that they can't put in papers, it's not because they're censoring themselves in their academic papers. And again, you know, I make this point really strongly in the book because it's, it's been heavily influenced by my dialogues with climate scientists over the years, that what a climate scientist can offer you in the pub is the benefit of their judgment as somebody who works with this science. And scientific research is not meant to be a matter of judgment. It's meant to be what you can demonstrate according to the methods and practices of the field within which you work. So there is a gap between what can be published as scientific research and the judgment that the scientist as human being deeply immersed in this research can offer you down the pub. And based on those judgments, based on the conversations I've had, I would say it's a reasonable reading of the signs of the times that what we're dealing with in case of climate change is not a problem that can be fixed and made to go away or made manageable. The predicament is calling our whole way of living into question. But uh, in saying that, I'm not ruling out that somebody can come along and read the signs differently. You know, there are plenty of people out there who are ready to tell you how we can fix all of this and make it all fine and make it go away. And uh, my business is not to convince anybody that it's all going in the direction that I read it as going in. Mm. Because if you're not convinced of that, there are people who are you know, much better placed than me to, to lay out what we know and what we have good grounds to fear about the trouble we're in. My role is really to come in after that work and create spaces of sense making and conversation in which we can puzzle through what this might mean, what moves might be worth making in the face of it, like what kinds of tasks can be worth giving our time to if this is our read on the signs. So yeah, yeah that's, that's where I'm coming from, I guess. Well, thank you for, thank you for uh, uh, wrangling with that. Donald, always, always good to hear from you. Uh, we have uh, a whole bunch of stuff has come up in, in the chat. I, I just wanted to pull out a couple of things. Uh, Carl Aho, and Carl, forgive me if I mispronounced your last name, uh, points out a group called Philosophers for Sustainability, uh, a group trying to do environmental work in the context of the philosophical profession, uh, which is great. Uh, we've also been um, trying to track down uh, citations um, and uh, <clears throat> pages about some of the different scholars you've talked about, which is great. Uh, and um, we also have uh, apparently a disaster happening near me. I'm, I'm sorry about that. Um, uh, that seems to be sliding past, although that's not inappropriate uh, sound effects. Um, uh, Peter Rothman asks what you think about the uh, drawdown project, uh, Drawdown Group. So I, I haven't followed the Drawdown project closely enough to, to be able to, to comment on it. Um, I guess as a, as a more general comment, um, I'm, I'm a big fan of um, an idea that was first voiced to me by Michael Greer, who is a very interesting uh, kind of outsider scholar and thinker. Um, he writes at Ecosophia dot org and he talks about the virtue of dissensus mm, mm. So a lot of us if we've been involved in environmental movements and activism in particular have been sort of taught to value consensus decision making where we engage in these long drawn out processes to try and arrive at something that everyone can can go with and what Greer says is you know when you're dealing with a complex situation where none of us knows how the story is going to end what's needed is not to waste lots of energy on trying to arrive at a single agreed shared plan what's needed is groups of people of goodwill pursuing different possible 
answers, different possible paths into the unknown world that lies ahead without wasting too much energy on pretending that we can know now what might become apparent in hindsight about what it was that turned out to make all the difference. So my default approach, whenever I encounter things, whether it's the Drawdown Project or other initiatives that are kind of on the edge of my radar, but I haven't necessarily had the time to engage deeply with, is just to get a read on you know, the people involved in this and the, the sense of you know, the goodwill of uh, what's going on. And then to ask the one question, which is, you know, is people pursuing this path undermining the possibility mm -hmm. of there being any other viable path? And that's the place where the, you reach the limits of dissensus. So that's why I would be strongly against a lot of the geoengineering proposals, for example. That's why I'm mm -hmm. deeply skeptical about a lot of the kind of our destiny in space versions of the future. But, you know, there's, that's, that's territory that we could dig, dig further into in another conversation. But, yeah, dissensus is a starting point that I find helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Um... We have a pause right now where um, uh, all the questions have, have been asked, um, which means we have two terrible prospects. One is me asking more questions, um, and the other is for uh, those of you to uh, start following up on some of your thoughts and commentary uh, and to turn those into questions. Uh, you can tell that uh, Dougal is uh, definitely very friendly and, and taking this very deeply. Um, I guess this does bring us back to education in a, in a, in a different way. If if we follow Illich, as I do, um, uh, his Deschooling Society is for me one of the greatest books that education has written. Uh, if, if, if we see that education as a whole has trained people, among other things, to be consumers, uh, is, is now a good, a good role for education to play to prepare people for the post-progress world, uh, to prepare them for the, uh, the economy and the society, the culture and everything? that occurs after the story ends. And if so, what have you learned from your work uh, with all kinds of different organizations, including your school called Home, that might shed some light on an answer? How, in other words, what and how then should we teach? As you were speaking about Illich, I found myself thinking of some of his later writings on education mm. that aren't as well known, but um, that are available um, there's a, a website run by a guy in Arizona, David. I'm doing badly at surnames. I'm doing badly at names tonight, but it's okay. um, you can find it if you search for Ivan Illich's articles and um, papers online. And there's one there where he comes to Chicago in the late 1980s, and he's been invited to speak about schooling. And he says, I arrived very jet lagged and I found myself, my hosts were organizing a book group where they had people around at their house who had been reading the book of Schindler's List. This is before the mm. film ever came along. And he said, I was drifting off to sleep because of my jet lag in the corner of the room. And as I was drifting in and out of sleep, this, this horrible thing happened. And he says, you know, as someone whose mother was Jewish, who had to flee from the Nazis in my childhood, there is absolutely no way I can justify the association which my mind made on the edge of sleep. But as I listened to them talking about the book, my mind was thinking about this series of articles about a particular head teacher in an inner city school in Chicago who had been you know, putting his body on the line in front of guns and knives and in the middle of all kinds of chaos. And he said, and in this dreamlike state, I got him confused with Oscar Schindler. And it occurred to me that what I ought to say is that if you work in education inside a system today, then rather than projects of trying to reform the system, what you should be trying to do is a bit like this very strange character of Schindler who emerges in the book. Trying to just offer a shelter to those within your reach without pretending that you can help everybody. And what I mean by that, taking it on from Illich's admittedly outrageous analogy, is that you can create a pocket in which it is safe to show up as a human being in ways that modern industrial society has not often allowed us to show up. This is definitely what we try and do at a school called home and what I see in the other outsider schools like the one that Martin Shaw runs or like Stephen Jenkinson's Orphan Wisdom School in Canada and I could name other examples. 
is these pockets we create where it's safe to be vulnerable. It's safe to bring mm. parts of yourself to the conversation that don't just come from the head intelligence, but the heart and the gut intelligence as well. And the reason that I bring Illich's horrific Schindler analogy into that is because if you're working inside an educational institution, and I, I talk all the time to friends in higher education, you know that there is plenty of horror actually in the, the kind of war of all against all of the academic career, in the worsening of the conditions for those coming up behind the more established generations, in the rates of attrition between the PhDs and the postdocs and the people who finally get tenure, in the conditions that many people in your institutions are working under. And, you know, in that situation, I don't think your job is to tell beautiful, brilliant stories about how we could reform the institutions or make these institutions in their systemic form the havens within which we can create the conditions for what's going to be needed in the worlds to come. But I do think that if you show up as a human being willing to create pockets of safety for those who work with you and those who study with you, you can make your classroom. You can make your little corner of your institution into something that's not what the institution as a whole is often doing to people. And maybe if you're lucky, if you're in a position of institutional leadership, you can even make your particular institution somewhere that has more room for people who are willing to show up and do that. You won't be able to do it all yourself from a position of leadership because as I used to say when I worked at the Swedish National Theatre and I was working with the the artistic director there and he was in you know the a role of leadership that was way beyond anything that he had experienced in the roles he'd worked in before i used to say to him look what i see is that the kind of power you have in that role it's a bit like driving a car and you know how when you're driving a land rover across a field at 15 miles an hour you can throw the steering wheel around like that and you have to because you're bumping around when you're driving down the outer barn in an Audi at 200 kilometers an hour, if you move that steering wheel more than a tiny amount, you're going to roll the car and crash and cause a whole lot of trouble. That's the powerlessness of power, is that if you're holding that kind of institutional power, your room for maneuver gets smaller and smaller. Usually, there are moments where something utterly different becomes possible, but usually that's what it's like, holding that kind of institutional power. But what you can do is you can look for those occasions to empower the individuals working under you who are creating pockets in which it's possible to show up differently and bring more of ourselves to the classroom in a way that is you know, safe. And yeah, those are those are the those are the things that I, you know, in dialogue with my friends who are working inside institutions try and support people to be doing. That's a, a very, very clear answer, and that reveals um, a great deal of knowledge about how universities work. Uh, so you should you should feel completely confident at that point. Um, so we it reminds me a bit. I'll, I'll put this. I'll, I'll share this with you uh, uh, afterwards, Tugel. There's a, a fascinating book um, by an academic under the pseudonym of um, La Paperson called "The Third University Is Possible." It's a tiny book. It's about ninety pages. Um, but makes a similar case for uh, uh, carving out individual nooks and crannies uh, within institution to uh, get a, to do something other than uh, what is what is horrible. Um, thank you, thank you. Uh, we have a, um, a question that comes in uh, from uh, a repeat, a follow-up question from uh, from Tom Hames, who is uh, reading Illich uh, this week, in fact, which is a nice a nice line. And he says, "Isn't post progress?" fundamentally at odds with the mission of learning in the Illich sense, which has a deep connection with growth and progress. So I, I think you've been, you've been speaking to this a bit, I guess, if, if you want to say a bit more along those lines. Yeah, great question. Thank you, Tom. Um, so it depends what we mean by progress, I suppose. Progress, if we take it back to the roots, and you know, I, was, I, I studied English literature and language at Oxford. That was my academic background. So I'm always kind of drawn to etymology. So progress literally means movement towards. And it seems to me that when you speak about a, a specific goal, then progress is a coherent concept, a coherent way of speaking and thinking. 
you know, we can talk about progress towards the eradication of polio or malaria. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that it, it's meaningful and rigorous to invoke progress in that context. Once we move to speaking in more general terms about progress, I think we get into trouble because I'm not sure that it is possible. Well, let me put it slightly differently. I think that one of the, the characteristics of modernity was that the future worked, that the future could be invoked as a, a vessel for collective hopes and possibilities and projects. And some extraordinary achievements were made as well as some horrors perpetrated by using that power of the logic of progress and the appeal to the collectively imagined future. And about 50 years ago, a threshold was crossed on which the surprising resilience of that concept and that function of the future reached the end of the road and we found ourselves somewhere mm. else, somewhere where the future doesn't work the way it used to. And under neoliberalism, the future is kind of rebooted in this privatized form where it all becomes about your individual gamble on the future earnings potential represented by your degree and the rest mm -hmm. of it. Mm -hmm. But um, so the logic of progress used to work as a way of mobilizing people. And when I say the logic of progress here, I'm talking about this kind of cultural logic in which we appeal to a general sense of progress. It always had a shadow side. And I think Illich was good at bringing these kinds of shadow sides into view, which is that in order to speak as if we can have general progress rather than progress towards a specific goal, it is necessary to treat history as the kind of thing that can be meaningfully subjected to a cost benefit analysis. We can weigh the gains against the losses that everyone can agree on which are gains and which are losses. And we can net that out to a number year by year, which tells us whether we're getting closer or further away from a goal that would constitute progress. And my um, provocation is that unless we're prepared to own that, which I think is generally a hidden assumption in progress talk, then really when we invoke progress in that general sense, we are, you know, we're kind of using it as a warm, fuzzy word to point towards things we like and that we think everybody else should like. Mm. Now, mm. the pushback that would be reasonable against this, which when I first began to articulate these thoughts, influenced by Illich and other thinkers and in dialogue with all sorts of people, and I'm talking about 15 years ago, a bit more on the path that led to writing the Dark Mountain Manifesto. People would say to me, but, 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 you know, are you saying that the changes in infant mortality over the last six or seven generations aren't progress? Mm -hmm. and, and it took me a while to get to the bottom of how to answer that. And the answer that I arrived at, and actually it was once I became a father myself and mm -hmm. had the experience of looking at my young son a few months old and going wow you know even with all that i know and all the things i talk about it still comes naturally to me born in the time into which i was born and him being born into the time in which he was born for me to look at him and almost be able to take it for granted that i will live to see him grow strong and he will live to see me grow old mm -hmm. and as i sat with that and as i was w writing about this kind of the problem with the logic of progress in the light of that i said here's the thing you know it is possible to affirm that the changes that have transformed you know what birth means both for infants and for mothers uh, over the last six or seven generations it's possible to hold that those changes are good important and you know pretty much beyond question um things that matter and should be defended and at the same time to say it does not help to bundle those up into a larger singular story of progress you know, especially if it is the case that we're going to live through the unraveling of the settlements of modernity then we would be much better and i got into dialogue recently with Richard Smith, the former editor of the British Medical Journal, who's taken oh. up some of the material I've written about in this book and is uh -huh. using it precisely to do this as someone with 50 years at the heart of the field of medicine behind him, to move in the opposite direction. Instead of moving from that achievement upwards to a big singular story, 
to move down into the granular and the specific and say, how did that happen? What are the conditions that made it possible? How do we pay attention to that so that we salvage as much as possible and get to take as many of those achievements with us into mm -hmm. worlds that will be in many ways poorer and more difficult than the world of the developed countries into which most of us were born in the generations into which most of us were born. And so that's really my challenge is that, you know, we can get beyond this narrowing that is inherent in the logic of progress to something that is more true to what biology has to tell us about evolution, which is it isn't this kind of upward march of progress. It's more like a branching interweaving mycelium. And we are, you know, we're living through the end of the world as we know it, I would suggest. That's not the end of the world. It's the end of a world. There are unknown worlds. There are paths to be found into that. Are there things that we will want to take with us from what is ending into whichever world we find ourselves growing old in? And that's really the invitation that's at the heart of you know, both what Paul and I were setting out to do in the Dark Mountain Manifesto, which was a first attempt from the two of us to frame these things that were still mainly intuitions for us at that stage. And now 15 years on in at work in the ruins, you know, it's me looking back on the conversations and encounters and work that I got to do as a result of the impact that that manifesto made and, you know, trying to bring that down to, at the end of the book, I say, like, here is an unfinished list of some tasks that might make sense if you share my read on the signs of the times. What's worth doing if we're living in a time of endings? And I say, well, here are four examples of kinds of tasks. One is to salvage good things that we can take with us and do our best to contribute to the possibility of those things being taken with us into whatever mm -hmm. kind of future we end up in. Mm -hmm. The next one is to mourn good things that we're not going to be able to take with us. And as an act of mourning to tell their stories so that the stories are taken with us because those stories may yet act as seeds in worlds that we won't live to see. The third one, and this is very strongly influenced for me by Illich, is to notice the things that were never as good as we told each other they were within mm. what is ending. And the chance that we are being given to walk away from some of those things that looked like unquestionable goods and where in that you know, Hegelian sense, you know, the owl of Minerva flies at dusk. There are things that it only becomes possible to see in the end of the arc of a story. And that includes those things that were, you know, sacred when that story was at its height that are worth calling into question. And again, we've had 50 years of scholars and now I'm thinking of James C. Scott or Anna mm -hmm. Singh mm -hmm. as examples of scholars who've done incredibly generative work in helping us begin to do that that kind of owl of Minerva work on the logics of modernity. So that's the third one, is noticing the things we're being given a chance to walk away from. And then the fourth kind of task, and I know that there are more than I've thought of, this is just my list. The fourth one is to look for the dropped threads from earlier in the story. The things that we've been told are obsolete or already vanished or marginalized. The things that look like the past, even when they're here in the present, that might actually turn out to make all the difference to the finding of viable paths. And if you want a single example of that, I would point out to you that there are two billion people in the world today who are part of peasant farming households. Mm. Logic of progress is so powerful that even when that fact is invoked, in the next breath, we usually talk as if that is all going away soon even though the end of that has been predicted since Marx was around. And there is a surprising resilience. Chris Smage in his book, A Small Farm Future, does a brilliant job of unpacking the possibilities contained within that. But the logic of progress is so powerful that a thinker and activist like George Monbiot, who I have a huge amount of admiration mm -hmm. for, mm -hmm. can assume that those two billion people and their way of living are going away and that one Finnish startup that promises to feed the world with vat grown mm -hmm. uh, golden dust mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. the future of how humanity is going to find paths through a climate changed world and feed itself. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, with respect, I just don't believe that that's the most plausible future that lies ahead mm -hmm. for us. 
So that fourth task, looking for the things that have been written out of the story because they look like they already belong in the past. And drawing on scholarship, drawing on history and anthropology, though doing it very humbly, recognizing all of the blind spots that have been there within the work of those disciplines and the ways that they have treated people, to find the drop threads from earlier in the story that we might be giving a chance to weave back in alongside the things we're trying to salvage and take with us from the end of the world that the end of the house modernity built, as Vanessa, as Vanessa often puts it. Not to mention, with great sorrow, I must say, the end of our hour together. Um, you, you, you timed that perfectly, uh, Dougal. And I, I had a question. Uh, dear Nix in the audience uh, was asking um, a question along those lines. So I'm glad that you anticipated it um, and got to address it. But with great regret, I have to wrap things up. It's been fantastic talking and thinking with you, Dougal. Thank you so much. Uh, I, I know, well, besides getting your book, and again, everybody on the bottom left of the screen, you should see a, a button that takes you to it. How else can we keep up with uh, with your work? How else can we keep up with a school called home? And how else can we keep up with the progress of your thinking and conversations in the world? Well, if there's one thing to do, aside from getting your hands on the book, if you want more of this, then... Um, I'd say just sign up for my newsletter on Substack. That's right. That's right. Google.substack.com. It's called Writing Home. And I say that because all of the news of things coming up with the school and other projects that I'm involved with will come through that portal. So that's the best way to follow along with the work that I'm Very doing. Good. Keep in touch and join in the conversations around it. The school is you know, pretty quiet at the moment publicly because you know, we're in this process working with our existing membership community and then I'm pretty busy with the book. So in half a year or so, when we're on the far side of the gathering in Patmos, I suspect mm -hmm. that we'll be opening out into the world with more invitations and openings to collaborations there. But yeah, sign up for the Substack and I'll look forward to the chance to be in dialogue with people in the comments there and in other ways. And uh, I wish you all best on the road to uh, the Apocalypse Island. Um, <laughs> Which one are you great. talking about, the UK or the one in Greece? Just Patmos for this time, just Patmos. But in, but in, but in, I'll, I'll, I'll let you go with the UK as well. Thank you so much. Please have a good night and, and continue with this great work. Thank you. Thanks so much, Brian. Lovely to be with you all. Take care, everyone. But don't go, everyone, yet, because we have to uh, point you to where we're heading next. Uh, I do want to thank you all for the questions and, and comments. If you want to keep talking about this already, some of you have been tweeting, please just use the hashtag FTTE or tweet at me, your shindig events, or take this over to Mastodon, there's my handle, or hit my blog up uh, as well. If you'd like to look into our previous sessions where we talk about the great macro questions around the future in higher education and climate change in particular, just head to tinyurl.com slash FTF archive and you can find them there. Looking ahead, we have a whole stack of sessions coming up, which some which are connected to this, some which go off in other directions. Just go to forum.futureofeducation.us to see more of those. And if you'd like to share any of your work, uh, any of your work either along these lines or others, please drop me a note uh, so I can share it with everybody else. In the meantime, thank you again for thinking in such a, a dark and large register. Uh, thank you all for coming and sharing your own thoughts and questions. I hope you all stay safe and well and we'll see you next time online. Bye-bye.